In the last episode, we talked about how there's only so long that you can hide the impact of World War I from civilians, soldiers, and the general population. By the time 1917 rolls around, everybody is feeling the effects of the war, from civilians to soldiers, like we said, whatever group you want to dissect society into, women, children, men, governments as a whole, the international economy, everybody is feeling the heat from World War I. Just take the civilians, for example. So World War I was really impacting civilians at this point in all of the countries involved. The civilians of France were probably the least affected, even though about 25% of agricultural workers who were supposed to be farming and producing food went off to war. When you have a number that big, it means that others have to step in and contribute to the effort on the home front while those people are out fighting the war. Britain was dealing with food shortages, they were dealing with lack of nutrition, an increase in tuberculosis and infant mortality during the war, in part just because a lot of the doctors were actually with the army on the continent in France, and when people got sick with these illnesses, and when people are dealing with just kind of routine illness, that can become more dangerous because the doctors might not be there, or the family structure might not be in place, or there might be shortages in food and medicine and stuff like this, and This is kind of the underrated way that war impacts a society. It's not just on the battlefield. Russian cities were filled with refugees. The typically inefficient czarist government can't get food to them. The railway system was in disarray. Riots and strikes began to infect the cities of Russia due to food shortages and labor issues. What little food and supplies there were would often go to the troops first, and this was the case in all countries. Usually the military would take priority over the civilians, so this just made the conditions in cities in a lot of these countries, and especially Russia, even worse. We'll talk more about Russia and how these food shortages and issues and strains from the war would ultimately lead to the Russian Revolution but we'll get to that later. In Germany and Austria-Hungary, the naval blockade that the Allies put on Germany is absolutely crushing them. In terms of food shortages, food prices are going up. This is all compounded by the fact that the harvest in 1916 was disastrous in Germany, and many thousands of civilians had to deal with relying on eating turnips as kind of the main food source during early 1917 and the winter of 1916 into 1917. This winter would become known as the turnip winter. It was especially cold. Food was in very short supply. 80,000 children in Germany would die of starvation in the latter part of 1916, which is just an incredible fact. And there's just no doubt that the conditions were really bad. Families could only heat one room at a time. In many cases, this led to an epidemic of pipes freezing and bursting, which is, of course, only going to make things worse. Families were forced to eat dogs and horses in order to survive. Listen to one German woman talking about life during the blockade during this period in early 1917. Quote, One of the most terrible of our sufferings was having to sit in the dark. It became dark at four in winter. It was not light until eight. Even the children could not sleep all that time. One had to amuse them as best one could, fretful and pining as they were from underfeeding. And when they had gone to bed, we were left shivering with the chill, which comes from semi-starvation and which no additional clothing seems to alleviate. To sit, thinking, thinking. End quote. A German kid who was going to school during this time would say later on, quote, Everybody seemed to be keeping rabbits because of the shortage of meat. They took us out in whole classes and sent us into the country to help the farmers. We liked that, but it meant we didn't get much teaching. All the teachers were out as soldiers anyway, and generally the whole life of the country was becoming grimmer. There was a strong sense of people saying, this war is lasting too long. Some became quite outspoken. The feeling was that 
the war was lasting too long and that Germany didn't have much of a chance of winning it because the conditions within the country were getting so very difficult, end quote. This is a great example of where you can come up with all the propaganda you want and you can try and sell the war as being successful in all the different ways you want, but eventually the impact of the war is going to be felt by the people. And they're going to start seeing through the lies and the deception because conditions are so bad. I mean, in Vienna, over 10,000 women were trying to survive just through prostitution. It reminds you a little bit of the horrifying stories from the Great Leap Forward in China that I went over in some of those old school Reflecting History episodes. But it just demonstrates survival was at the top of the menu. And doing whatever it took to survive for some of these civilians was absolutely what they were going to do. These stories are great examples that one of the themes of 1917 is that whole countries are becoming demoralized by the war and World War I starts to tear many countries apart. great example of the demoralizing impact of World War I is simply the economic cost. So the ultimate cost of the war was somewhere around $208 billion. Keep in mind this is 1914 to 1918, so I'm not even sure I could calculate how much that would cost in modern terms. Germany spent about $47 billion, the British $44 billion, the French $28 and when you're fighting a total war with mass conscription and women and children in the workforce and the stakes, as we talked about in the last episode, are so high that neither side has the option of losing, you're going to have to do whatever you can to pay for whatever you need to pay for to win the war. So for the most part, how did these countries pay for it? They borrowed money and they spent money that they didn't have. The reality of the situation is that as long as you have men willing to fight and food to feed them and materials to allow them to fight with, economic conditions are never going to stop a war. Germany and Austria-Hungary borrowed internally, taking loans from domestic banks and selling war bonds. The Allies borrowed heavily from the United States. U.S. banks were owed immense amounts of money by the time 1917 rolled around. And a lot of people actually think that if the Allies ended up losing the war, the United States economy would really be hurt because of all that money that they had lent out to the Allies. Some people also think it made practical economic sense, business sense, for America to enter the war because they wanted to get paid back what they were owed. Overall, all of this borrowing and spending was probably not good for the European or global economy. And when you factor in that a lot of this credit was simply used to create materials for the war effort, it wasn't exactly contributing to a robust global economy. Historian G.J. Meyer calls this process disinvestment. Here's what he says, quote, all the European powers stopped making the kinds of investments required for real economic growth. Everything, even in the future, went into the flaming cauldron of the war. Britain, that paragon of affluence and commercial success in 1914, ended the war sunk in debt, its civil infrastructure a shambles. The Europeans had begun the war at the pinnacle of the world's economic and financial hierarchy, and they ended it as wrecks. End quote. So we know that the actual soldiers on the battlefield, the millions of soldiers, are just living and fighting in some of the worst and most horrifying conditions imaginable. We now know that the impact on civilians is, in many ways, almost as bad. We've also established that the economic conditions in most of these countries is pretty terrible. And when you combine all of this, it's going to start leading to political meltdowns. So even governments and people in power were not immune to the disastrous impacts of World War I. The logical place to start along this train of thought 
is probably with the Russian Revolution in early 1917. Obviously, there's major problems in Russia, particularly in the big cities. Just to name a few, you obviously have the ridiculous casualties and stress of World War I. Add to this that the winter of 1916-1917 was particularly cold and especially snowy. Food and fuel were not getting into the big cities. The railway system was jammed up. People couldn't make bread. People weren't getting any rations of food. People weren't able to make said rations of food. And the conditions were ripe for riots, strikes, protests, and ultimately revolution. You have to remember that Russia at this point is ruled by Tsar Nicholas II, and the buck stops with him. His wife, the Tsarina Alexandra, is imploring him to be more firm and more aggressive in how he handles some of these protesters and some of the riots that are going on in big cities. Here's what she says, quote, Lovey, be firm, because the Russians need you to be. At every turn you show love and kindness. Now let them feel your fist. End quote. So here's the Tsarina, as usual, imploring her husband to be more ruthless. The Tsar's response is perplexing at best and really confusing in a lot of ways. It's almost like he's resigned to his fate and he, he kind of just gives up. So on Wednesday, March 7th, amidst protests and riots, he leaves the city and goes to the front line to visit his troops. Probably unnecessary, and many historians have called this an act of depression or even escapism, as if he didn't want to be in Petrograd at the capital dealing with these issues. Over the next couple of days, from March 8th to the 12th, the riots are getting worse. The military class of Russia, known as the Cossacks, who are normally supposed to defend the Tsar, actually join in or step aside in certain cases with the protesters. The Tsar himself would finally issue a bizarre order. Here's what he says, quote, I order that the disorders in the capital, intolerable during these difficult times of war with Germany and Austria, be ended tomorrow, end quote. Obviously, this does nothing to alleviate the concerns of any of the people protesting or give any sort of instruction to the people who are back in the capital asking what the heck are we supposed to do here. It's almost like a half-hearted order he gives here just so that he can say he did something. On March 12th, many of the soldiers actually join into the protest, which are now turning into large-scale riots. Many of the soldiers felt like they were tired of fighting in World War I and wanted to get back home to be with their families. By this point, the Tsar realizes this is a disastrous situation. He's heading back slowly on one of his trains, but he seems resigned to his fate and is asked to abdicate the throne. On March 15th, he does abdicate. He gives the crown to his younger brother, who promptly gives it up himself, and boom, that's the end of the Romanov dynasty in Russia. People in the United States, Britain, France, are actually in many cases celebrating. Some people never felt comfortable in an alliance with autocratic and czarist Russia. Most people thought that a democracy would surely take the place of the czarist regime and nothing could possibly be worse than the czarist regime. Oops. And while many people would be wrong about this, of course, there were many people in Russia who were thrilled. Listen to one Russian talking about the first phase of the Russian Revolution here. Quote, God in heaven, it's like a miracle of miracles. It all happened so quickly. Such joy, such anxiety that I can't get on with the work. I want to convince all the doubters that these developments are good news and that things will get better for us now. Good Lord, it's so great that Tsar Nicholas and the autocracy no longer exist. Down with all that rubbish. Down with all that is old, wicked, and loathsome. This is the dawn of a great new Russia, happy and joyful. We soldiers are free men. We are all equal. We are all citizens of great Russia now. 
The police are being arrested. Their weapons are taken away from them. Please, God, let it be like this forever. End quote. A provisional government would take over in Russia, led by a guy named Kerensky, who would actually continue to have Russia fight in World War I, at least for a time. This is, many historians think, a major mistake. He was making decisions, Kerensky was, such as abolishing the death penalty for desertion, which of course led to one million more desertions, and keeping Russia involved in the war, furthermore, planning offensives in the war, which is only going to upset soldiers more. Around Easter time, Russian soldiers and German soldiers get together for a lesser-known Easter truce of 1917, and it just exemplifies how many of the Russian soldiers no longer wanted to fight in this war. A guy by the name of Vladimir Lenin became the leader of the Soviets or the communist faction in Russia, and they were slowly but surely gaining more control and waiting for their opportunity to take over the government. Lenin was also capitalizing on the discord and disarray that the Russian population and military was in. Listen to one of the German soldiers in July of 1917 talking about what he sees on the Eastern Front. Quote, Yesterday we saw heavy fighting, but only among the Russians themselves. A Russian officer came over and gave himself up. He spoke perfect German. He told us that whole battles are going on behind their lines. Their officers are shooting each other, and the soldiers are doing the same. He found it all too ridiculous. They can all get lost as far as he's concerned. We invited him to eat with us, and he thanked us. He ate well and drank plenty of tea before going off. There was a lot of noise coming from the Russian side yesterday. They were fighting each other in the trenches. We also heard shots coming from their infantry, but they were firing at each other. Charming. End quote. As we said earlier, Kerensky planned another offensive in July. It turned out to be a massive failure. They ran into German defenses that were sophisticated, and the Russians retreated at best, deserted, fled, and fought amongst themselves at worst. And policies like this by the provisional government paved the way for the Bolsheviks and Lenin to take power and pull Russia out of the war. So by the time 1917 is over, Russia is out of the war, and they are into a new phase of their history, which is equally as tragic and horrifying as World War I was for Russia. The stresses of World War I were affecting all of the countries, not just Russia, and Germany was changing politically as well. By 1917, Germany had essentially become a military dictatorship led by Ludendorff, the top general. As we've talked about before, the military had always had a huge amount of sway in the German style of autocratic government anyway. The Kaiser at this point was weak and felt like he had to follow along with Ludendorff and his buddy Hindenburg because they kept threatening to resign and really throw the whole war effort into disarray. The thing about Ludendorff is he just wanted to win the war. And he's thinking from a military standpoint, not necessarily a political standpoint, or a standpoint that really cares about the civilians and people in Germany. Ludendorff would be promoting this concept of war socialism. The idea is that everyone needs to contribute to the war effort. Not just the soldiers, but also civilians, and not just civilians in Germany, but also civilians in other countries. As an example, he would take tens of thousands of Belgians, herd them into cattle cars, and ship them into German factories where they could begin working on stuff to help with the war effort. This program didn't work out too well just from a numbers perspective, as far as what they actually produced. It was a huge PR nightmare. Once the United States and Britain got hold of this, it was kind of used against Germany. And quite frankly, it's just a little scary and maybe even reminiscent of future events that would be happening in Germany. Ludendorff would also try to create a 
separate Polish state that would be loyal to Germany and fight for Germany. This had very little chance of actually succeeding. It ended up taking off Russia and reducing any chance of a separate and quicker peace than what would actually happen between Germany and Russia, which of course would give the Bolsheviks more room and more time to operate, and was just another example of Ludendorff's poor political decisions, even though he might be a capable military general. The last important political decision made under his watch here is the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. So the Germans had this big fleet of submarines, and they were going to start unleashing them on civilian ships. Anything around Great Britain that was bringing in supplies, food, stuff, etc. The problem for Germany was that, as we talked about at the beginning of the episode, the blockade that the British were putting on Germany was really affecting their civilians, but it was also affecting them as far as getting supplies and stuff for the military. Talking about unrestricted submarine warfare, Ludendorff would say, quote, It's the only means of carrying the war to a rapid conclusion. The military position does not allow us to postpone. End quote. So to the Germans, it was morally and politically justified, and they might have an argument there when you consider that turn-up winter that we talked about and how poor conditions were, but from a political perspective, many people were worried that it was going to bring the United States into the war. It would turn out to be the wrong decision in hindsight. Obviously, a couple of United States ships would get sunk, and this would contribute to them getting into the war, but... Many historians also say that at this point, Russia was on the verge of collapsing, and if they had just waited a few months without doing this, maybe Russia gets knocked out and the United States doesn't come in. Furthermore, from just a practical perspective, they sunk a ton of shipping, but it wasn't really enough to impact Great Britain the way they thought it would. So they did sink hundreds of thousands of tons of stuff, but at the end of the day, it wasn't worth the cost. And at the end of the day, that cost was giving more ammunition to certain factions in America that wanted to go to war. In early 1917, the United States and the president, Woodrow Wilson, were engaging in peacemaking efforts. So these efforts were spearheaded by Woodrow Wilson, but ultimately they were failures. Anytime both sides came to the negotiating table, they were afraid to appear weak. So both sides would come out with very strong positions. And the idea is, well, if you start out with something that might be very strong and might be a lot, you can negotiate down to a more reasonable point. So this sounds great if you're reading from Michael Scott's 14 Wikipedia negotiation techniques, but... The problem is that in reality, the stakes are too high and the emotions are too strong, and when both sides come out with these pompous, strong positions, the negotiation falls apart. As these negotiations are falling apart, there is an increasingly large faction led by ex-president Teddy Roosevelt who want Woodrow Wilson to go to war and join on the side of the Allies against Germany. And maybe the last straw that's going to pull the United States into the war, at least according to the traditional story, is something that's known as the Zimmerman Telegram. So Arthur Zimmerman was the head of the German Foreign Ministry. And this story is almost too ridiculous and unusual to believe. After he had taken a few train trips through the United States, he now claimed to know exactly how Americans think, and he comes up with a scheme. And the scheme is to get, of all countries, Mexico and Japan onto Germany's side. And he wants to embroil the United States in a separate war with Mexico if it comes to war between Germany and the United States. He mostly comes up with this scheme on his own, and what he comes up with is called the Zimmerman Telegram. He sends this thing to the German ambassador in Mexico, not the Mexican government, as is often mistaken, 
but here's what the Zimmerman telegram says. Quote, We intend to begin unrestricted submarine warfare on the 1st of February. We shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. We will inform the president of the above most secretly, as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States is certain, and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the President's attention to the fact that the unrestricted employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England to make peace within a few months. End quote. So basically he's saying, look, we're going to do this unrestricted submarine warfare thing. If the United States gets involved in the war against us, then figure out a way to make Mexico go to war with the United States. That way they'll be distracted, and if you do that, We'll give you some money, and you can have some of those old territories back. And oh yeah, it'd be great if you could get Japan involved on this too. The problem, of course, is that the British are reading these German communications. They got the message, and they figure out a way to tip off the Americans. So when Woodrow Wilson and his cabinet hear about this, obviously they are furious there's a growing number of politicians led by Teddy Roosevelt who already want war, and this is just stoking the flames. To further add to Zimmerman's questionable decision-making here, he actually pretty idiotically admits that he wrote the letter. Many actually thought that it was so ridiculous, this idea of Mexico and Japan and all these things he was saying, that this was just propaganda from people like Teddy Roosevelt. Some people actually didn't believe that this telegram was real. And then Zimmerman goes out and says, yep, it was me. So within a few weeks, due to a lot of different factors, propaganda, the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, this new round of unrestricted submarine warfare, economic factors, nationalism and patriotism, the United States would be at war with Germany. The House of Representatives would vote 373 to 50 in favor. The Senate would vote 82 to 6 in favor. And on April 6, 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany. But even as that was happening, there was plenty of question to what declaring war actually meant. So the United States only had a 130,000-man army in 1916, they had no tanks, very few planes, few machine guns, very little training or tactical strategy as far as anything close to resembling a modern World War I style of war. Many people who even voted and declared war didn't actually believe that declaring war meant sending troops to Europe. The chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee said, quote, Congress will not permit American soldiers to be sent to Europe, end quote. But a military draft and some training by the French and British militaries later, and the United States was doing just that, sending troops to Europe. They wouldn't get there until 1918, but sure enough, they would get there. And President Woodrow Wilson, who ran on the campaign slogan of He Kept Us Out of War, in 1916, just a year later, would be declaring war on Germany. 1917 was obviously a complicated year with tons of stuff going on, and you have civilian and economic and political shakeups going on, but as much as things were changing, they were still staying the same in many respects. Because, oh yeah, the carnage on the Western Front was still ongoing. There's two specific events in 1917 that get a lot of attention, and rightly so. The first one is called the Nivelle Offensive, and the second is 
the Battle of Passchendaele. To understand these two big events on the Western Front, you first have to understand what Germany was doing at the beginning of 1917. So Ludendorff was actually pulling back his defenses and creating what was known as the Hindenburg Line. He pulled back his defenses in order to make the area he needed to defend a little bit smaller and free up a couple of divisions so that he could add them to the new defenses that he was setting up. The basic idea was pull everybody back, then install heavily fortified block houses in a checkerboard pattern in what we would call no man's land. So before you get to the first couple rows of trenches, you now have these fortified block houses with machine guns in them, shielded by barbed wire, that are funneling attackers towards the new block houses. Then you have additional lines of defenses that go back, in many cases, miles, and it's truly a miles deep killing zone. It's the evolution of trench warfare in a sense. Here's historian G.J. Meyer talking about the new Hindenburg line. Quote, As it took shape, it proved far too formidable for the humble term trench warfare to remain appropriate. It began with a trench, but one that was to remain unoccupied. This trench was almost 10 feet deep and 12 feet across, a trap for tanks, and an equally formidable obstacle for men advancing on foot. Behind it, one after another, were five or more rows of barbed and razor wire, each row 12 feet deep and twice a man's height, each 20 yards distant from the next. Then came the blockhouses, with two machine guns in each. Beyond them, dangerously far beyond, for enemy infantry trying to advance under fire, lay the first true line, a largely underground beehive of chambers and passageways covered with up to eight yards of earth and impregnable to artillery and bombs. Farther back still, also down below the surface and positioned wherever possible on a reverse slope so as to be almost unreachable by artillery, were two lines of guns. This was defensive warfare raised to a new plane. It appeared to be invulnerable. End quote. The basic idea was to slowly pull back, and as you're doing it, you're defending and killing the troops that are trying to attack you instead of throwing everything you have into defending one or two lines of trenches, you're now luring the enemy into this killing zone that's going to be virtually impossible to break through. While this is happening, and while they're preparing for this on the German side, on the French side, a charming commander by the name of Nivelle is preparing for a massive offensive. Nivelle is able to convince the people that matter that this offensive has a good chance of being successful. And this includes him convincing the new Prime Minister of Britain, David Lloyd George, who actually likes Nivelle, believe it or not, because of something called phrenology. This is the pseudoscientific claim that the shape of someone's head is a big indicator of character, intelligence, etc., so Lloyd George liked the shape of Nivelle's head and gave him the go-ahead from his perspective. This stuff writes itself, folks. Unbelievable. But there were many proven commanders in the French army, including Patton, who knew that this was not going to work. Obviously, the Hindenburg line was going to be ready for it, and Nivelle was just playing right into the Germans' hands by planning this massive assault using by now, old tactics that he learned at Verdun. On April 6, 1917, about 1 1.2 million men would begin the assault at what was known as the Nivelle Offensive. Now, make no mistake about it, the French troops and the French soldiers, by and large, did not want to take part in this battle that they knew wasn't going to work. Listen to one of the French soldiers talking about this, quote, They read out an order of the day from that mass murderer of April 16th, General Nivelle, to inform his troops, that is to say his victims, saying amidst other nonsense that the hour of sacrifice has arrived and we must not think about leave. 
reading this patriotic nonsense aroused no enthusiasm. On the contrary, it only demoralized the soldiers, who heard nothing but another terrible threat. New suffering, great dangers, the prospect of an awful death in a vain and useless sacrifice, because no one trusted the outcome of this new butchery. However, our commanders did not seem to doubt for a moment that the Germans would be routed. End quote. Just like virtually every other Western Front offensive launched by the French or the British, the Nivelle offensive turned into a disaster and a failure. And within a couple weeks, Nivelle would be out as the French commander-in-chief and Pétain would take his place. Here's Peter Hart talking about the Nivelle offensive, Nivelle falling from power, and the unbelievable sacrifices that the French army and the people in the French army had to make during this war. Quote, Nivelle's ultimate fall was probably inevitable. Under his tenure, the French army had finally reached the end of its endurance. Too many Frenchmen had already died for their country, and, if the war continued, many more would share their fate. In just over a week from April 16th, another 30,000 had been killed, 100,000 wounded, and 4,000 were missing. One of them was 2nd Lieutenant Jean Louis Cruz, who had the misfortune to be hit by shrapnel and was lying abandoned in a shell hole on April 16th, 1917, when he painstakingly wrote a last card to his family. He had not been particularly lucky in life. Two of his three daughters had died of tuberculosis, and only one, Lucy, survived. His last note is a poignant document. Quote, My dear wife, my dear parents, and all I love, I have been wounded. I hope it will be nothing. Care well for the children, my dear Lucy. Leopold will help you if I don't get out of this. I have a crushed thigh, and I'm all alone in a shell hole. I hope they will soon come to fetch me. My last thought is of you. End quote. Peter Hart goes on to say, quote, Very shortly afterwards he died, probably as a result of a hemorrhage. When his corpse was found, his stiffened fingers were still clutching the card. It was sent on to his grieving family. More than a million French families had been thrown into mourning by the war. Millions more had to face the return of their badly wounded sons. End quote. I think that story and that letter that Peter Hart found really says it all about what's going on in the minds of the soldiers who are fighting in World War I during 1917. By the end of this disastrous Nivelle offensive, the French army had a full-scale mutiny which was now possible in the army. There was widespread discontent Troops were getting drunk, refusing to take orders. Violence against officers was going on. Amazingly, the new General Baton was able to calm down the mutinous behavior. So he was able to reestablish discipline, and he did this in a way that wasn't too harsh. He understood that many of the men who were mutinous had also served France for two or three years at this point. He went from division to division, visiting 90 divisions in all, and talking common sense and answering questions for people who needed it. He gave them better food, more leave, and this type of stuff worked. And ultimately, the French army was able to survive 1917. But a lot of people think if the Germans had attacked during this period of kind of mutinous discontent, it could have been very bad for. France, and Britain. Later on in the year, it would be the British turn to try and make a breakthrough. General Haig would decide on Flanders and Ypres yet again. So this third battle of Ypres became known as Passchendaele. And what you need to know about the geography of Flanders is that it's extremely flat and it's a lowland, which means it's going to be wet, almost like an estuary. And when it rains, it's going to turn to mud very quickly. Haig's subordinates and even the French are telling him about this, and the chances of a successful breakthrough are 
pretty small. Everybody's telling this to Haig, and he's going to continue with the offensive anyway. It's almost like a a broken record that's on repeat where the same thing seems to be happening over and over again. After a huge bombardment on July 31st, the troops would advance, and here we go again. The Germans are luring the British into their miles-deep killing zone. The Brits, in large part, are taking the bait. They're making some territorial advances, but they're also taking huge casualties. I mean, 23,000 casualties in a day. The rain begins to fall, and the mud is getting worse. Shell holes that have been blown up by artillery shells are now filling up with water, and Haig is forced to postpone the assault, which he would later resume, but sometimes postponing the assault is actually not as great as you might think for the soldiers. Here's one British soldier talking about his experience in a bunker when the attack got postponed and he's just waiting in the bunker. Quote, Inside it was only about five foot high and at the bottom there was about two foot of water. This water was simply horrid, full of refuse, old tins, and even excreta. Whenever shells burst near it, The smell was perfectly overpowering. Luckily, there was a sort of concrete shelf the Bosch had made about two foot above ground level. It was on this shelf that four officers and six other ranks spent the night. There wasn't room to lie down. There was hardly room to sit upright. And we more or less crouched there. Outside the pillbox was an enormous shell hole full of water, and the only way out was over a 10-inch plank. Inside the shell hole was the dead body of a Bosch who had been there a very long time, and who floated or sank on alternate days according to the atmosphere. The shell holes were crowded with dead and dying men, the latter crying out for help as they slowly expired. End quote. The term Bosch, by the way, just refers to Germans. The mud and the water was obviously horrifying. Ironically, there was nothing to drink for the men because... You obviously couldn't drink the water that is in this swamp, essentially. It's now been poisoned by dead bodies and disease. And you actually can't get materials to the men at the front lines because the mud is so deep that wagons and carts and horses and vehicles can't move through the mud. The British would make some tactical discoveries that would prove useful later in the war, But ultimately, Passchendaele was just another example of the horrors of the Western Front. A couple hundred thousand casualties here, a couple hundred thousand casualties there, very little territory gained, no concrete military objective established, no breakthrough. And stories like this one from Private Norman Cliff, which... If it weren't a primary document, and if I didn't trust the historian where I'm getting this from, Peter Hart, in his book The Great War, I simply wouldn't believe this story. Private Cliff is talking about men who are essentially drowning and getting swallowed up by the mud at Passchendaele. Quote, The approach to the ridge was a desolate swamp over which brooded an evil, menacing atmosphere that seemed to defy encroachment. Far more treacherous than the visible surface defenses with which we were familiar, such as barbed wire, deep, devouring mud spread deadly traps in all directions. We splashed and slithered and dragged our feet from the pole of an invisible enemy determined to suck us into its depths. Every few steps, someone would slide and stumble, and weighed down by rifle and equipment, rapidly sink into the squelching mess. Those nearest grabbed his arms, struggled against being themselves engulfed, and, if humanly possible, dragged him out. When helpers floundered in as well, and doubled the task, it became hopeless. All the straining efforts failed, and the swamp swallowed its screaming victims, and we had to be ordered to plod on dejectedly and fight this relentless enemy as stubbornly as we did those we could see. It happened that one of those leading us was Lieutenant Chamberlain, and so distraught did he become at the spectacle of men drowning in mud 
and the desperate attempts to rescue them that suddenly he began hysterically belaboring the shoulders of a sinking man with his swagger stick. We were horror-struck to see this most compassionate officer so unstrung as to resort to brutality, and our loud protest forced him to desist. The man was rescued, but some could not be, and they sank shrieking with fear and agony. To be ordered to go ahead and leave a comrade to such a fate was the hardest experience one could be asked to endure, but the objective had to be reached, and we plunged on, bitter anger against the evil forces prevailing piled on to our exasperation. This was as near to hell as I ever want to be. End quote. The next time someone tells you that war can be glorious and purifying and grand, go ahead and show them that. <laughs> <laughs>